Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Garrity and I'm a resident organizer with the CVOEL Mobile Home Program. And today I'm joined by Laura Mistretta, who's another resident organizer, of the CVOEL Mobile Home Program. And we're here today to do a presentation, um, it's an info session on emergency preparedness planning, actions and tips. And we're gonna be doing this as a part of our civic engagement project, which we've been doing um, in two communities, in the St. George Community Cooperative and also in the Mountain View uh, mobile home park in Heinsburg. And all right, so let's start off here. Why is being prepared in case of an emergency important? Because it saves lives. So you, you may be wondering, first of all, where do I start? That is, the, that is the first question that should come to mind. And so, you know, when preparing and planning for emergencies, it really just begins with identifying past ex emergency experiences. You're gonna wanna identify hazards that your, you know, your past um, experiences, um, from your past experiences, from your neighbor's past experiences. You're gonna wanna think about the history of the area regarding big and small events. Um, also, if you recently purchased your home, you're going to want to consider asking the previous homeowner um, of their, you know, you know, their experiences and anything that they've identified as a natural or man-made hazard um, or disaster that they encountered um, in their time there. And also make sure to ask questions. Um, you want to know how often a certain event might happen and also what the result of that event was, how severe it was. And also, you know, this, you know, these things are going to help you put together a list of priorities um, that you can do uh, better planning with. And when you have all these things, you can take these priorities and, you know, basically take that plan and put it into action. And next, we'll go on to making your home safer, which Laura will take over. Yeah, so once you, like Ryan said, once you've, you know, done some of that research um, and can think about some of the, you know, that will really give you the best direct specific information to really focus on. So here we're just going to provide some general tips and ideas for what could be important things to really think about and ask questions about. So we're going to cover your personal property, utility shutoffs, fuel spills, and fire safety in this section. So on the next slide here, um, so when it comes to your home, the, the stability and safety of your home, really one of the most important pieces of your home is the foundation. Um, it can be, it's really helpful and, and critical to know what foundation your home is on, if it is on one. Um, home, it's been shown that homes that are on slabs or other permanent foundations are more secure and hold up better over time than other homes. But if your home is not on a foundation, there's definitely things you can do to help maintain the stability of your home. And really what that means is checking, you know, just paying attention and checking out what is going on underneath your home. If your home's on blocks or, you know, it's maybe some, you know, other kind of more mobile um, uh, materials, you know, making sure that those are not, um, that they're actually like bearing weight and actually doing their job of holding up your home versus just sort of floating on the ground there underneath your home. Um, if you were to notice that a block is loose or perhaps a part of your home, you know, there's a new slant to the floor that you don't remember having when you first moved in, that's probably a really good sign that you're going to want to consider having an expert come in and talk about re-leveling your home. Um, it could also be a sign that there is some sort of drainage issue on your lot that may be compromising, you know, the stability of your, of your home, which would be a park owner responsibility and is something our office could help you with. Um, so again, 
getting to know what kind of foundation your home is on is really important. And then depending on that foundation, there is some maintenance that would be really recommended to keep your home stable. And you know, these, these foundations, they're, they're not only important just for kind of the longevity of your home in, in, in just in normal day-to-day -day life, but we're thinking about in the context of emergencies, you know, if there was a flood or, a, you know, we're in Vermont, so we shouldn't get too many hurricanes, but we've seen Tropical Storm Irene, um, you know, these sort of really, uh, I'd say, you know, sudden in, intense weather events that could impact the stability of your home. Something that would that really helps uh, withstand those sort of big events is having tie downs. <clears throat> so also looking at looking at which you know is attaches underneath your home and to the ground. So again, opening up that skirting, getting under there, and making sure you know what your home is sitting on is a really good place to start. So next slide here, um, and now. Obviously, so we talked about the home as a structure. And now what about all the stuff inside your home? Um, you know, we all have, I'm sure, more things than we know what to do with in our homes these days. And so really taking stock and thinking, what is really important to me? What if I needed to leave my home, you know, due to a fire or a flood and had to act quickly where are my most important things? And you know, this could mean kind of more typical items like your insurance policy or your social security card or birth certificate, but also things that are just meaningful like pictures and you know, a diploma um, or you know, your, your kid's first baptism dress, you know, there are so many things that could be really important to you and your family. And so thinking about where are these things located? Are they located in sort of a, a central place? Are they in a container that's protected from water? Um, these are the kinds of things that we would encourage you to think about. And just to go through some of the other maybe more formal documents that could be really key to, to know where they are, Again, talking about, you know, homeowner's insurance policy, life insurance policy, um, and let's see, and, and other important records. Um, we recommend keeping it, making an inventory of your personal property. And if there's things in, you know, things that are really valuable, you can consider having them insured. Um, and then of course, another thing is if, if you live in a household of multiple people, it's a great idea for everyone to know where the important things are so that if there's an emergency and the head of the household is not there, others are, are ready and able to grab the important things and, and go. All right, another important piece of, you know, protecting your home and your belongings is knowing how to shut off utilities if needed. Um, you know, this can be really the kind of the main utilities we're thinking of here are your electricity, your fuel, and your water. Um, and, you know, it can be really helpful to keep a list of phone numbers for all of your utility providers uh, or state, you know, departments related to those utilities for some communities. You know, if your sewer and water is all maintained by the park, then you really just want to have that property manager phone number somewhere safe and, and obvious. Um, however, and when you, we encourage if there is an issue that you do contact these entities, you know, as soon as makes sense. But in case there, you know, you need to act, uh, it's also really great to know how to turn off your water or your electricity or even your fuel should there be an issue that is putting the rest of your home or others at risk. So for example, when it comes to water and say, you know, the pipes freeze in the winter and, and burst, you're gonna wanna get that water shut off as soon as possible. Um, especially if water is flowing in your home, but also especially if there's water flowing underneath your home, because like we've talked about, the foundation of your home is a really important part of your home's 
stability and safety. And so generally speaking, you know, there, there should be about three different ways to shut off water to a home in, in a mobile home park. There often will be a curb stop valve, which will be located outside of your home. This is a part of the park's infrastructure um, and is, you know, may even just be indicated by like a small metal circle in the ground on your, on your lot. Um, this may not be a super accessible way for you to personally shut off your water because it often requires a special key or tool to shut it off. And so that would be something a property manager or you or um, would have access to. But there are at least there are at least one and sometimes two other ways to shut off the water right to your home. So underneath your home, um, you know where your home's water pipes connect to the park's water infrastructure, there should be a shut off valve, and this will turn the water off to your whole home from where the home connects to the park's water line. Um, and it's usually a pretty simple like valve or, or something that can turn. Um, oftentimes there's also an indoor shutoff that is located by your water heater tank. This will just turn the water off from inside the home. So, so which shutoff you wanna use can also depend on what is the emergency. If the pipe burst under your sink in your house, you, may, you just need to shut off, you know, you may just need to use that water heater valve. If the pipe underneath your home is the one that froze and burst, you're gonna wanna turn that main shutoff valve off to keep, you know, from, to keep the water from flowing under your home. Um, you know, depending on the age of your home, the shutoffs may be look, they look different or be located in different places. So definitely get to know your own home or ask neighbors that have similar homes to you and, and see where exactly you'd find these important valves. When it comes to your fuel, this is something that really would be best, you know, ask of your fuel dealer. Uh, you know, messing around with a fuel tank can be very dangerous, risky, not just because of fire hazard, but because it is considered, you know, it's an, it's an environmental pollutant if fuel spills on the ground. So really we encourage you to talk to your fuel dealers directly and get this information from them so they can show you right in person what would be the best way to turn off your fuel supply if you need to? And, and always when reconnecting fuel, it's best for a professional to do that again, because there's such a risk from, you know, po of pollution or, uh, you know, just a fire risk in general. When it comes to your electrical, one of the most helpful things you can do is get to know your breaker box. We all have one. And we all, I think, I know I've experienced the, the issue of some part of the house just went out. I'm, I have to run down to the basement and figure out which, which switch is the right switch. Um, so something that can be really helpful is getting to know your breaker box and labeling it. Label it really clearly so you know what goes to the kitchen, so you know which goes to the bathroom. And so if there is an emergency, if there's a fire in the oven, um, and you need to cut the electricity off from just a part of the house. <clears throat> you know exactly, there's no fumbling around, you know what you need to do. Um, so yeah, that, and that basically, that about covers it for the utility portion here, though we are going to talk a little bit more about fuel. Like, like we mentioned, um, you know, kerosene, propane, fuel, these are all really flammable, dangerous materials um, that are right up against our homes, um, but also they are highly regulated environmental pollutants. So the state of Vermont has put a lot of effort into updating its standards around fuel tanks to help decrease the chance of fuel spills um, and keep them you know, safe from flooding or other events that could end up in a fuel tank falling over. And the main things around this is there are new, fairly new requirements that say that all fuel tanks need to be on slabs, on foundations. Ideally, they need to be covered either by an overhang from your roof or have its own little roof. And of course, there's general, you know, rules around the actual, um, uh, you know, quality of the tank and the and the other parts of the fuel system to to be aware of. All the fuel dealers have really been trained and um, instructed to be the monitoring force 
around these rules. So your fuel dealer will tell you um, if your fuel tank is in need of repair or replacement or upgrading. And thankfully, there is some a pretty generous grant available through the Agency of Natural Resources to give up to $2,000 to a household to replace or upgrade your tank in whatever way your fuel dealer has said it needs to be upgraded. So you see here on this slide, there's a lot of kind of emergency phone numbers and information, but also so like we're planning, so much of planning is really thinking ahead and making sure we can avoid these emergencies in the first place. And that for this situation, making sure you're just, you know, you're heeding your fuel dealer's um, recommendations and, and taking care of any issues that may pop up with your tank or making sure that they're following the most up-to-date regulations is, is really the best thing you can do in this situation. And then last but not least, fire safety. We're talking about fire safety a bit here, but this is more talking about, you know, kind of pretty common sense stuff, but, you know, we wanna make sure that all your, you know, everyone's home has a functioning smoke alarm, making sure that those batteries are still good. Um, you know, uh, it's important to, in the winter time, be really careful with any space heaters, making sure that they're not left on without someone being conscious to, you know, kind of monitor them, not throwing like clothes on them or whatever, or kids stuffing toys in them. Um, and, and then also, you know, just making sure you're storing any any flammable fuels outside of your home. If you're if you're able to have a shed, it's a great place to keep you know extra gasoline or kerosene or or any other fuels you might need on a daily basis. Um, you know, really important to make sure that all your heating equipment or just major appliances are installed by someone who knows what they're doing and and is you know licensed to do that work. Um, and, and also making sure that, you know, any additions you've put on your home, um, are up to code, which the code, you know, a lot of codes are geared towards safety to making sure that porches are stable, you know, making sure that if you don't typically use your back, your back door in your home, making sure that there's still a, a way to, to use it in an emergency. I feel that's, you know, putting in some stairs or whatever, but um, yeah, just kind of thinking through how, how can I, would I be able to leave my home safely and quickly in the case of a fire? Great, and now moving on to the next section here about preparing your family. So we talked about preparing your home. Now we're talking about preparing your family. We're gonna cover in this section briefly, family communication plan, emergency budget and funds, emergency kit, persons with special needs. And of course, last but not least, how to make sure your pets are a part of your emergency plan. So moving into this first part here, family communication plan. Um, so again, much like how you know, with your important documents and, and memorabilia, you want, if you are in a household of more than one, it's important that everyone in the household knows where the important documents are. Also, it's important for everyone in the household, and we're, we're gonna include kids in this too, that, you know, everyone knows where the emergency phone numbers are, um, that they're clearly marked, which phone number, you know, goes to who. Um, and, and that they're accessible to, to be accessed in an emergency. So if that's keeping it on your fridge or you know, next to the door, um, picking some place to really store some, really, some key phone numbers so that you and your family have them when you need them. Um, some other suggestions, yeah, in keeping these contact numbers you know, in your car, in your wallet, some, and, but also somewhere everyone can see them. Another thing, um, you know, again, thinking about with your family, like thinking through where, how would, how would people leave the home in an emergency? Um, 
again, like we just talked about, if, even if your back door is not a door that you typically use, is it clear? You know, do you have a dresser in front of it? Are there stairs that go from it to the ground? Um, you know, do your kids know how to open the windows if they needed to? Just talking through, you know, where, how you would move through the home in an emergency and thinking about where it's the most likely part of the home where an emergency could happen. Or thinking about like a kitchen fire, you know, how would that change how you need to leave your home? Um, so, you know, you can do this, you can we recommend here drawing a sketch of your home, reviewing it with your family and marking two different escape routes from each room um, so that there are options and, and practicing this, especially with kids, practicing this so that it's an automatic reaction to an emergency. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and another part of this is it's once you leave the home, then you want to know where to go. And it's best to have that planned out ahead of time. Again, this is all about trying to reduce the number of decisions that need to be made in the time of a crisis so that people aren't having to think through options in a stressful moment. So thinking about, you know, if you had to leave your home, where, where would you meet? Is there a neighbor's home, you know, maybe a couple houses down that you really, you know, are close with who could be a meeting point inside your community. If you can't stay inside the, the mobile home park, is there, where, where's the closest place outside of the community that you could meet? And just know that like that is where you're going to be in the case of an emergency. It's also helpful to, you know, think through um, someone, think through sort of like a key emergency contact who, lives outside of your community or even maybe outside of Vermont so that if people got separated um, that everyone had you know has a person has the same person to talk to and call um, to kind of be the check-in person in an emergency um, in case you know your household members have been you know have been separated and aren't reachable. Again, bringing children along in this in, you know, whatever way you can is great. You know, teaching children the importance of calling 911, the use of calling 911, teaching them, you know, making sure their phones are programmed with a couple numbers they could call um, if something comes up when you're not around. Um, and again, here, talking again about keeping all your important documents in a waterproof place that's known by everyone and can be grabbed at a moment's notice. So moving on from communication, um, also thinking about the money needed to, to get through an emergency. Um, you know, we, um, it can be maybe intimidating to consider what kind of money you need in an emergency. And so, you know, what we, what we kind of recommend is thinking through like, what are your regular monthly expenses and how much money would you need to have saved to know you could cover you and your family for a month, two months, three months, you know, whatever time period, um, as mean as long of a time period as you can is, is obviously I think, you know, is, is recommended. Um, and that if you don't have that money in savings right now, it's okay. It's never too late to start. It's never too early to start. Even if there's, you know, $10 at the end of the month in a budget that can go be put aside in an emergency fund, um, you know, should something happen, that that money could be really, really useful. Uh, something that came up in talking with folks around this too is th making is thinking through if you have homeowner's insurance, making sure you have the homeowner insurance deductible on hand so that, you know, $500 doesn't stand between you and, you know, and, and returning to stability as quickly as possible. If you don't have homeowner's insurance and have struggled with that, we recommend checking out Foremost Insurance as they typically do cover a lot of manufactured housing. Um, and... Yeah, so that's that. Thank you, Laura. Awesome. Move on here to the emergency kit. 
And so you're going to want to put together an emergency kit, um, actually a couple emergency kits. And this would really just include, you know, about three days of essential supplies in case you're cut off from basic services for, for a few days. And also make sure that your family members know where the kit is located. Uh, you know, if you don't know where it's located, then it's kind of pointless. So gather the supplies gradually. So, you know, buying a few extra food items here and there each month um, until you have enough. And then also labeling and dating each container. Uh, you don't want to make sure you want to make sure things don't go bad. And uh, storing all the supplies in a dry, cool place and in a plastic or metal container to protect them from pests. And yeah, just like I said before, um, making sure that they uh, don't go bad using the food before it expires and then replacing it um, as you use it. And you're generally going to want to keep about a gallon of water per person per day and keep your uh, keep one kit in your home and also one in your car if you have a vehicle. And if you think the power is going to possibly go out, uh, depending on the situation, what emergency situation you might be in or facing, you might want to ahead of time just fill your bathtub with water um, in advance. And you know you can use it for cleaning, you can use it for flushing your toilets. And uh, for any family member with a health condition or a disability, you're also going to want to plan several ways to address any of the special needs that they might have. And going from there onto the next thing here, it's going to be persons with special needs. So you should really, you know, know, you know, kind of what's going on with your household and have an idea um, of, you know, any person who has special needs that lives in your household. Uh, but you really want to plan in advance um, for anybody who has special needs um, in your household. And if you have any, you know, folks in your family that do have special needs, you're going to want to communicate those needs um, to responders before an emergency happens. Uh, before is really important because it really, you know, helps take a lot of the pressure off of those responders and also make sure everyone is ready um, to deal with everybody's needs at the time the emergency is happening. And so, just a few examples of, you know, anybody who, you know, might be considered having special need, uh, somebody who has a walking disability, um, a sight disability, or a hearing impairment, or, you know, they might have a need for a specialized medical equipment. And there is also the emergency management director um, or the Vermont emergency management numbers here that you can call. And so these are all, you know, all the information that, you know, you call in, um, when you call these lines, it's strictly confidential. And also, these lines are only for use during an emergency only. So you don't, don't call just to ask questions. It's, this is really just for when you're in an emergency, you're going to want to call. And um, you're going to want to also fill out a health information sheet and keep a copy on you um, and, and also in your car um, and also maybe with a neighbor um, in case of an emergency. So you have all the information for that person. And lastly here, protecting your pets. I think that everybody who has had a pet or has a pet now knows how important um, our friends are to us, our furry friends. And so just like any other member of your family, you're going to want to make sure that you are protecting your pets. And so, you know, being sure that your animal has ID tags and also up-to-date vet, uh, veterinarian records, setting aside supp emergency supplies that are needed for things like medications for your pet, um, also making sure you, you have extra food for your pet, identifying any animal shelters or alternative housing um, for your pet. If you have, you're in a situation where you can't take your pet with you wherever you're going to go, uh, if you're not able to stay in your home, some hotels allow pets and some do not. So doing a little bit of searching to find out where nearby, you know, you may allow pets, uh, where, you know, a boarding facility might be located for, for uh, pets. And in case that you do need to relocate, just keep in mind too that some, you know, most shelters do not allow pets. And if you have a service animal, you're going to want to make sure you have proof uh, that your pet is a service animal and also be covered, you know, legally. And also that will make sure that you have your animal allowed to stay with you at that location and also with your family. So make sure that you have all this situated before an emergency happens so you can keep your pet with you and keep him safe. And with that, we will move on to 
to the end of our presentation today and just giving you a little bit of information here on if you have any questions or if you have any information that you would like to get, you can always contact the CVOEL Mobile Home Program at our office number. We have a hotline that you can call at our office hours or any time and we will get back to you. And we also do have emergency planning uh, documents. So if you would like to actually put together an emergency plan, um, you can give us a call and we can help you um, do those and get you set up with one. And also, if you if you really, you know, in your community want to have us come and do this presentation and, and present this information in person um, and, and you know, give this information to the community, then please contact us as well. And so with that, thank you so much for coming and hope you have a great day. Thank you.